Okay, welcome everyone um, to today's lecture. Last week we spoke about polynomial interpolation. We saw that polynomial interpolation yields the result we are looking for. It yields a function that goes through uh, the set of prescribed points. However, um, the approximation is usually it's, it's interpolation, it's not an approximation. Actually, we are able to interpolate these points. There's a fine distinction between approximation, getting a function that is only close to the points and interpolation. However, um, the function we get, uh, the interpolation polynomial, oscillates between those points. And this is a property that we would not like to see in this interpolating function. Um, we did this here. It's quite simple to do it with uh, uh, MATLAB. It has a function built in polyfit that yields the interpolating um, polynomial. However, uh, you can already see here that the function, uh, instead of going through the points like this, it oscillates down here. Um, we can try to uh, make it a little bit better. Um, and this is one of the fascinating things about polynomials. One would think that, and if you're coming to university from high school, um, you would think that polynomials are always given in the monomial um, um, representation, in the monomial basis. However, uh, polynomials are linear space. There are infinite bases for a linear space. And in this case here, you can change, um, you can change um, the um, nodes, uh, the supporting points at which you want to interpolate a function from equidistant points to what we call the Chebyshev supporting points, the Chebyshev Stutzstellen in German. Chebyshev being the Chebyshev polynomials being yet another uh, famous basis of the linear space of polynomials, the Chebyshev basis der Polynomien. So the easiest thing, if we are not given a set of points, but if we can choose at which points we want to evaluate the function um, and which points we want to use as uh, supporting points, as nodes, um, we can use equidistant points. For example, if we want to approximate a function or interpolate a function on the interval from 0 to 10, we would think, okay, let's take 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Let's use these points, these 11 points as a nodes. Evaluate uh, the function f at these nodes. So f of 0, f of 1, f of 2. Then we have 11 function values. And then let's interpolate the function through these points. It is still uh, a great help to us because we only need to know 11 function values and our computer only needs to calculate 11 values. That's, that's okay. However, equidistant points will lead to this uh, severe oscillation between the nodes. We can try to make it a little bit better and we can use the Chebyshev supporting points. So xi is not equidistant. This here looks, it looks a little bit complicated, but actually uh, if you have an interval from A to B and you want to uh, cut this interval A from A to B into equidistant intervals, this is how you do it. Yeah? You take the difference between B minus A and then uh, you have N steps and this is what it will look like. Yeah? Wenn, Sie, wenn Sie jetzt ein Interval von A bis B haben und Sie wollen das in 10 equidistante Teile teilen, dann müssen wir natürlich mit den Grenzen arbeiten. Das ist keine große Sache hier. So let's use the Chebyshev supporting points, the Chebyshev nodes. They are given below here, a little bit more complicated. They are obviously not equidistant, otherwise this wouldn't make much sense. Um, and we'll do it uh, quickly to interpolate the so-called Runge function, which is given by 1 over 1 plus 25 times x squared. Runge, uh, and we do the following. Runge is in line, is simply this function. First, we'll use equinodes from minus 5 to 5 and do polyfit. The, um, we'll estimate the interpolation polynomial and plot it. And then 
Down here in line 9 you can see the Chebyshev nodes are given by 5 times cosinus and so on. And then we'll do another interpolation here with polyfit and again plot it. Now the result is here for the equidistant nodes that between minus 5 and 5 the interpolation polynomial will it will oscillate quite heavily, especially here at the start, up to uh, 5. And here, actually, this, I should have drawn this in red, this is the function we are actually trying to approximate. Well, it is an approximation. This is a very rough approximation, as you can see. The Chebyshev nodes, they are much better. Again, this is in the interval between minus 5 and 5, but if you look at the y-axis, we are going from minus 2 up to 6 here, and here we only it only oscillates between minus 0 0.5 and 1. So the degree, the severity of the oscillation is smaller, but still it oscillates to some extent. So the Chebyshev nodes make it a little bit better, but they can't solve this basic fundamental problem of polynomials. So the disadvantages of polynomial interpolation are due to the fact that the objective function varies greatly in different places. There might be some parts where you have uh, actually a flat line, a linear function. There might be some places um, in the domain of the function where it is actually a polynomial, might even be, should be continuous, but still, um, the variation of the function can differ greatly. And if you need, and if you are looking for one function that is, has the same definition everywhere, this function has to deal with this varying, um, and, and this, uh, these differences in the variation of the function value. So what we are looking for um, is what I've described to you last week, a spline, a polynomial spline. A polynomial spline is simply a function that consists of small parts of polynomials that are glued together. Einfache Polynomstücke, die zusammengeklebt werden. And the, the necessary condition is that at these gluing points, the function needs to be continuous, ideally differentiable, continuous differentiable, twice differentiable, and so on. And um, it needs to be as smooth as possible at the seams. Glatt. Das sagt man auch im Deutschen so schön, dass so die Funktion soll möglichst glatt an diesen Nahtstellen sein. And the result uh, is a polynomial spline. So let there be n plus one nodes, supporting points, xi, yi. We assume that we are either given these nodes or that we can calculate them on our own. And we can now use for the approximation of f on each interval a polynomial si on each interval between two supporting points. So between two points xi and xi plus 1 will use the polynomial si of degree 1, which simply means that this is something that will look like this. Hmm? Again, remember, a linear function, grade, is a very simple polynomial, and if you are using polynomials, well, actually at this point, this will look like this. It might look like this. Now this is a function, but it's not smooth. It has discontinuities at those seams. So the very first condition is that the function is continuous, meaning that si at xi plus 1 is si plus 1 at xi plus 1. So at those seams, the two match. They have the same function values, if you are coming from left or the right. So that's the first condition that needs to be fulfilled. We need continuity. Then, if this is the case, then obviously 
This can no longer be the case, but it will look like this here. And we have continuity. Now with the Lagrange base polynomials, we have the following. We can describe each and every polynomial part of the polynomial spline um, using the x and y uh, values. So we have si equal to yi and so on and so on. And this form of interpolation is called a linear spline. The interpolating function is continuous, though its derivative is not. So it's actually just continuous. And we now want the function to be smoother, meaning we now require differentiability and even continuous differentiability. Bislang ist die nur stetig, jetzt wollen wir noch differenzierbar und stetig differenzierbar haben. And we can achieve this by increasing the degree of the single polynomial basis. Now, we use the following polynomials, Si with grade 3 or degree of degree 3, um, and we now have four coefficients, Si0, Si1, Si2, and Si3. So, meaning there could be, for example, Si3 times x to the third power, Si2 times x squared, and so on. So these are the four coefficients of the polynomial. And now the polynomial spline has to fulfill the following properties. Sx is xi, and then si0 plus si1, x minus x1 plus si2, and so on. So we have polynomials up um, of the third degree. Always one polynomial piece for each interval. Then, what is the third con first condition? The first condition is that the polynomial spline needs to interpolate these points. So the function value of s at the nodes x i is y i. So this is the interpolating property. The, uh, the second one here is what? It's continuity. And the second is differentiability. And the third is con continuous differentiability. So it's continuous, differentiable, steht differenzierbar. Warum? Jeder einzelne Abschnitt ist ein Polynom, ist damit unendlich oft stetig differenzierbar. Am Ende irgendwann natürlich die Nullfunktion, aber das ist dann trivial. Und an den Nahtstellen müssen dann erst die Funktion selber, dann ihre Ableitung, dann ihre zweite Ableitung übereinstimmen und dann ist auch an den Nahtstellen die Differenzierbarkeit und die stetige Differenzierbarkeit gegeben. And these properties obviously have to be fulfilled on all those intervals. The function we have here is called a cubic spline. Because we are using cubic polynomials. A cubischer spline twice continuously differentiable. The spline has four times n coefficients. Remember that on each interval we have four coefficients, so it's n times four. But we do not use up all of these coefficients and the degrees of freedom we have. We only, the continuity requirements, um, they are three n minus one and the interpolation property use up n plus one so only 4n minus 2 of our degrees of freedom are required, and we can um, require and set two coefficients um, by ourselves. And some common uh, assumptions are that the second derivative of s on the left, on the utmost left, and on the utmost right interval have the same value and are zero. That is what is called a natural spline. We could also um, set um, that um, uh, the second property here, that we know the first derivative, or we can require the continuity of the third derivative of S. Mm, these are options you have. Um, we need to solve a system of linear equations for this, and uh, 
we do not need to get into the details of this. This is readily available in MATLAB, but um, it's very easy to see that what is uh, what results is a triagonal matrix. Um, again, can be very large. So um, the solution of the SLE is actually quite simple. Uh, it might be it might take a little bit longer if the matrix becomes too large. So let's use this in MATLAB. We start with 10 points from 1 to 10. We assume that we are given the function values y, 8, 2.5, minus 2, 0, 5, 2, 4, 7, 4.5, and 2. We'll plot the function and then we'll interpolate it uh, on this set here on x2 um, and it's simply interpolate inter p1 and we'll have to set the option to spline and we'll do a spline and we'll plot it and you can see the result is much much better than for polynomial interpolation because now we can circumvent this problem that the the polynomial has to fit all of those regions of the function but it can differ from interval to interval and this is a spline uh, i've seen spline and uh, usage of spline everywhere uh, in economics and in finance if ever you have um, a set of data points of which you do not know from which function they have originated and you need to know the function you need to know some values in between you will always resort to spline interpolation. Actually, I, I still remember one paper that is a little bit older, I think almost 10, 15 years old. Um, I think it was by um, uh, the current president of the IWH in Halle, uh, Rentkop. Um, he wanted to do an analysis, I think, uh, at, uh, on monthly data. He wanted to explain something, and I think it was in one of his papers that he he used the idea of interpolating quarterly balance sheet data, also quartalsweise Bilanzdaten. Quite simple with balance sheet data, quarterly frequency is the best you can get. You will never absent of confidential data from within a company, but in a cross section of companies, you will never have a higher frequency than say quarterly data because companies usually um, publish uh, their, uh, their balance sheets annually and some do it quarterly and have quarterly reports quarter reports so if you need monthly data he had this idea well i have for each year i have four data points i'll just use a spline and take the values of the spline in between so, for example, if you are looking for the value of 4.5, well, you can simply take this one here. This is this is a little bit tricky. Um, I have never seen this. I, I, don't, I have not seen this too often in empirical analyses in finance that people have resorted to spline interpolation to uh, and used them on a balance sheet data. You can do it. Um, however, it's a strong assumption that um, even with few data points, you, you can estimate such a function on balance sheet you know, uh, items. Like if this, were, if this were total assets, I would assume that uh, a CPA would laugh at me if I argued that, well, we can use a spline to interpolate the balance sheet items. Mm -hmm. but every time you have... Uh, few data points and you need to evaluate the function in between these data points you can think about using a spline yeah and same with the function spline gives you the same result um, now we'll illustrate the advantage of a smoother interpolation again using this example of the runge function first uh, again we'll define the runge function We'll use the spline on equidistant nodes. We'll plot it and uh, increase the number of, um, of um, uh, nodes we're using. And uh, we'll increase it again. And you can see the result is here. So with 11 equispaced points and equidistant points, you can see that 
in those parts where the polynomial completely fail because the Runge function is close to a linear function, this is where even with few data points, it's, the approximation is quite well, is quite good. Why? Because in these areas of the function, you can simply, with the polynomial spline, you can simply use a linear function. But with 11 points, it's still a little bit difficult to come up with a good uh, interpolation even with 20 um, here uh, around the uh, zero. And something that is also quite interesting is, one would not think about this um, usually, uh, one could have the impression that more is always better. Well, could be, but it could also be that one less is better. If you look at the second and the third plot here, you will see that for the equi 20 equispace points, the approximation is not too good around the zero. If you increase the number of nodes by one from 20 to 21, the approximation suddenly becomes much, much better. We would have seen a similar result for 19 equispace points, and you can show mathematically that it makes a difference if you're using um, uh, a square or an even or an uneven number of nodes. That's quite famous with many algorithms and many techniques in approximation and interpolation that it does make a difference whether you're using 20 or 21 or 20 and 19 points. It might be better to use 19 than 20 points. And with 21 equal space points, you can see that the approximation is already quite nice. Um, so we see an increased number of nodes obviously leads to an improvement. However, an even number of nodes impairs the approximation near the functional maximum. And additionally to the cubic splines, there are of course numerous other spline types, you can use different ones. Um, again, this is a large part of numerical analysis, but also of computer graphics. Because splines are used heavily uh, in, um, they're used heavily in computer graphics, because it's a very simple tool uh, to give you a smooth function based on a very small number of points, and you can evaluate splines very quickly, and also splines are related um, to uh, Bezier polygons uh, and some other tools in geometry um, that make it possible to, to reduce the data you actually have to a minimum and only compute those data points which you actually need right now. Das alles, also wird natürlich alles auch im, im Maschinenbau und überall benutzt, weil es klar, wenn Sie jetzt irgendwelche Technik, also CAT ist halt auch ganz berühmt berüchtigt dafür. Ne? Uh, CAT uh, Berechnung und uh, in der Architektur und im Maschinenbau, wenn Sie solche Modelle machen, äh, gerade auch mit, mit Strömungsmechanik und ähnlichen Sachen, ähm, da arbeiten Sie ja, wenn das in, auch in Echtzeit passieren soll, arbeiten Sie nicht äh, stundenlang mit irgendwelchen hundertprozentig genauen Modellen, sondern da reicht Ihnen möglicherweise auch schon eine Approximation und ganz typisch halt in der Computergrafik, wo das menschliche Auge eh irgendwas dann irgendwann nicht mehr feststellen kann. Und wenn Sie jetzt sagen, ich will an diese Wand eine Linie oder irgendeine schöne Kurve zahlen, äh, malen, dann macht der Computer einfach das folgende, der nimmt bestimmte Punkte ähm, und wenn diese Kurve zum Beispiel in der Computergrafik sich verändert, dann rechnet er das nicht alles immer hundertprozentig neu aus, sondern er nimmt einfach irgendwelche Stützstellen, die setzt er selber, legt einen Spline durch oder auch dann natürlich die dreidimensionalen Äquivalente, wir haben die Spline, ich weiß gar nicht, wie es das nennt, ich meine Spline-Flächen, Spline äh, auf jeden Fall haben sie dann Splines durchgelegt und dann werten Sie einfach ganz schnell den Spline aus, zeigen den auf, der, auf, der, auf, der, auf dem Bildschirm und dann geht es weiter. Weil in als Computergrafik ist das nichts unbedingt schwierig, ist. es muss einfach nur schnell sein, weil sonst ruckelt das Bild. Das ist dann das triviale Endergebnis, wenn Sie, wenn Sie schlecht machen. Okay. Ähm, ja, BC-Polygone und BC-Flächen, das ist auch nochmal sowas. Ähm, was Sie das erkläre ich jetzt einfach noch mal kurz auf Deutsch, das wird jetzt auch auf Englisch ein bisschen zu kompliziert. 
Und ich erinnere mich auch nur dunkel daran, aus meiner Numerik-Ausbildung. Ähm, was Sie hier sehr schön sehen, ist natürlich, ähm, ähm, Sie können, wenn Sie so eine Funktion haben, die zum Beispiel so verläuft, und Sie haben die Stützstellen, das, was Sie machen, ist, ähm, Sie können auch dann die einzelnen Punkte miteinander verbinden. Ja, machen wir so. Und dann können Sie das alles auch noch, und dann, und dann verbinden Sie quasi auch noch immer die, die nächsten Punkte und äh, zeichnen dann auch die Tangenten ein. Und das, was dann am Ende rauskommt, an den Tangenten in diesen Punkten, äh, das dann wiederum auch äh, die Kanten eines BC-Polygons sind, meine ich, können Sie dann auch noch erkennen, ob ähm, die, der Spline dann auch hinreichend ähm, glatt an den Stützstellen ist. Und äh, Sie kriegen dadurch dann letztlich auch nochmal eine noch simplere Darstellungsweise für solche stetigen und stetig differenzierbaren Funktionen. Sie können das dann letztlich auf so einem so ein Bézier-Polygon dann auch noch runterbrechen. Und dann, dann geht es schon fast in Richtung Vektorgrafik. Ne? Weil wir dann letztlich so etwas Komplizierteres, auch eine glatte Funktion und glatte Kurven und hinterher auch Flächen, ähm, die haben Sie dann dargestellt durch letztlich so eine Gitterstruktur, die dann wirklich sehr simpel ist und die, die in 0, nichts ausgewertet werden kann. Das ist auch mit dann schon so der Einstieg und die Erklärung dafür. Vielleicht haben Sie das mal gesehen in manchen schlechten Computeranimationen oder wenn Ihnen mal gezeigt wird, ah, so ist Jurassic Park gemacht worden. Das, was da ja immer dahinter steht, ist ein Gittermodell. Das ist irgendwie, sieht so ein bisschen, sieht so ein bisschen aus wie so eine Pappmaschee-Figur, einfach so ein Drahtmodell dahinter und dann werden dann einfach, das ist noch das schönste Beispiel, genau bei diesen Drahtgittermodellen, auch in der Computergrafik, da arbeiten Sie quasi mit so einer Drahtfigur, ja, und, und dann legen Sie natürlich nur noch ganze Flächen drüber und diese, das sind Bézier-Flächen, die Sie darauf knallen. Hm? Haben Sie jetzt etwas unnützes Allgemeinwissen noch dazu bekommen? Okay. So this is spline interpolation and you could immediately use it on balance sheet data if you, if you think this is a good uh, uh, application of the model. But let's turn to uh, a much better example of an application, the term structure of interest rates. Everywhere in finance, we need interest rates. We need spot rates and forward rates. Spot rate is the interest rate you need to pay now for capital now. The forward rate is the interest rate you pay later on for capital that you get later on, but you agree on this interest rate right now. So forward rates, spot rates, we need those. And these interest rates, are given in terms of a certain maturity. I have a one-year spot rate, a five-year spot rate, a 20-year spot rate. This is the interest rate for capital that goes to uh, your investor for, say, five years or 10 years or 20 years. And the function that relates the interest rates to the different maturities is what we call the term structure. If you ever see the words term structure of yada, 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 it always means it's a function in T, the maturity. So that if I were, for example, to say the term structure of perfume prices wouldn't make too much sense, but then it would mean how prices differ in terms of maturity. In, in this case, it doesn't make sense, but in inter for interest rates, we have a maturity. We have prices that differ for different maturities. Term structure of interest rates is what is uh, what is interesting here now. And we need to calculate this and to approximate this based on available market data. And the market data we need come from the bond market. Government bonds, risk-free bonds. Because we're interested in risk-free interest rates. Right? So we'll start with a zero bond, maturity T, and a nominal value of one monetary unit. As is tradition in mathematical finance and almost all areas of finance, we'll fix the notional value of the zero bond at one, meaning that the current price will be lower than one given an interest rate that is higher than zero. And if the current price of the zero bond and the zero bond pays out one euro later, 
it means that the price of the zero bond is equivalent to the discount factor based on this um, spot rate. So at maturity, the price um, is one because it will immediately pay out one um, and will first define the discount curve. The functional association, the function relation between T, the maturity, and the price of a corresponding zero bond with this maturity is what is called the discount curve. Why is it called the discount curve? Simply think of an example. The price of a zero bond with payout one could, for example, be 0 0.9525. And 0 0.9525 or something like that will re should remind you of your basic uh, finance introduction class. It, it already looks a little bit like a discount factor, right? If you take 1 over 1 plus R to the third power, for example, the discount factor will likely be somewhere near 90%, 93%, 95%. So the zero bond prices, if the notional is fixed at one, if it's standardized or normalized, the, the prices of the zero bonds are equivalent to discount factors. Then we'll call it discount curve. The continuous forward rate is given by price with maturity T divided by the price with maturity S. In other words, discount factor divided by a different discount factor. The instantaneous forward rate is defined as the first derivative of the price function. And if we just take the function, maturity is mapped to the forward rate, then this is the forward curve. What is the forward rate, the forward interest rate for different maturities? You should have seen this in your introduction to finance. The forward rate can easily be calculated based on two different spot rates. Why? Let's make a quick example. If I know the spot rate from today, T0, up until five years, and if I know the spot rate from now until seven years, I can calculate the forward rate for a loan that will start in five years for two years. So from 0, 5, 7, so the spot rates from 0, 5 and 0, 7 will give you the forward rate that is agreed in 0 between 5 and 7. Very simple. Why? If they don't match, you will, have an, we, you will not have an arbitrage-free market. And you can construct an arbitrage by exploiting the differences in the spot and the forward rates. They will not match. So again, we need two spot rates. Spot rates are implicitly given by discount factors, and discount factors are nothing but zero bond prices. So if you divide zero bond price by zero bond price, again, no big surprise here, you are using implicitly two spot rates and then calculating the continuous forward rate. In this case, it's, continu it's a continuous um, return, but you can also do it a little bit simpler if you're using a discrete interest rate. So this is the forward curve. Maturity to forward rates. And last but not least, if you take the spot rate, if you're using a function that maps the maturity to the different spot rates, you get not the spot curve, but what we call the yield curve or the maturity structure or the term structure of interest rates. In German, Zinskurve, Zinsstrukturkurve oder Fristigkeitsstrukturkurve. Uh, Fristigkeitsstruktur der Zinssätze. Ja. Der, also wir haben drei Kurven. Auf die Bondpreise, das ist die Discount, Discount Curve, auf die Forward Rates, das ist die Forward Curve und auf die eigentlich interessierenden Spot Zinssätze, das ist die Fristigkeitsstruktur der Zinssätze oder die Yield Curve oder die Term Structure of Interest Rates. Okay. Now in theoretical interest rate structure models, a yield or forward curve is often assumed as a function of the continuous maturity T. This is obviously not the case in reality since we can only observe discrete quotes 
of interest rates or more or less um, we can observe the prices of bonds that are traded on the market and the set of bonds that we can observe is discrete. Was ist schon ein Zinssatz? Ein Zinssatz fällt nicht vom, von Gott gegeben vom Himmel. Äh, Zinssätze sind nur implizit gegeben durch das, was Marktteilnehmer verlangen. Und das, was sie beobachten können, risikolos sind Staatsanleihen, Bonds, ne, Rentenpapier. Und dementsprechend haben sie natürlich nicht für jede Fristigkeit, zum Beispiel wenn sie jetzt nur, machen wir ein einfaches Beispiel, wir nehmen nur die deutschen Staatsanleihen, der deutsche Staat emittiert nicht in stetiger Zeit jede Millisekunde eine neue Anleihe, sondern nur alle Jahre oder ein-, zweimal vielleicht im Jahr. Dementsprechend haben wir eine, eine endliche Menge an Anleihen und die legen die Fristigkeitsstruktur der Zinssätze fest. Okay. So, we need to approximate the time structure of interest rates. And in the following, we'll look at some examples. So, the subsequent task now is to approximate the current discount curve. Then we'll have the forward curve and the term structure of interest rates um, as bonus, but we'll concentrate on the discount curve. So, different maturities, and we're looking for discount factors a.k.a. zero bond prices. Now, if we only need, only, in parentheses, uh, if we only need to uh, approximate the prices, this boils down to what? We need to find a pricing model for the discount, uh, for the zero bonds. We need to come up with a theoretical model that can explain zero bond prices. And with zero bonds, it's quite simple. We have risk-free future cash flows, and the price of a zero bond should simply be the net present value of those future cash flows. Nothing is stochastic. It's risk-free. You will get your euro, because it's a, it's a government bond with a triple A rating. And It's quite simple. We need to find a solution to this problem here. Price vector on the left-hand side is given by cash flows times the vector of discount factors plus a pricing error epsilon. And this already looks like a regression analysis. It's actually just, just that. So P is a column vector of the market prices. We can observe those market prices of a finite number of interests Uh, bearing securities. C is the matrix of cash flows. Uh, and the cash flows result in not equidistant uh, points in time. Now, the German government, as an example, uh, issues government bonds every time it needs cash. And every time another bond uh, is paid back and matures, then it needs to refinance itself. So at some points, they will be equidistant. But in other parts and in other periods, you will see more or less issues. Best example, or two examples for Germany uh, after a reunification. Germany needed much more money to finance reunification. So we issued more bonds than usual. Right now we are issuing probably less bonds than usual because uh, we have enough money. Our budget is even. And a uh, second example is Greece. For some part during the euro crisis, Greece was not able to issue any bonds because they would have had to pay interest rates of up to 10, 15% on their bonds. So they didn't issue any bonds. So there's a gap in time. So those points in time we have and where we can observe cash flows, uh, they will be distributed quite randomly across time. And we'll see this in, in the example. So we'll consider the bond market. Um, you're given the following real prices of British bonds, so-called UK gilts, uh, on 4th of September 1996. It's an old example, but it works with any type of data. The nice thing here is that back in the 90s, we still had interest rates. So as you will see, the, uh, the yield curve uh, will give you even two or three percent for a maturity of three months. 
So it's completely unthinkable right now, but this is a very good instructional um, example. Um, to be 100% uh, exact, you need to adjust for the day count. You need to know on which dates the cash flows um, are received, whether it's the 28th of February, whether it's the 1st of March. So this might slightly change the result. In practice, this is not, this is not too difficult, but you need to take this into account. We have semi-annual coupon payment, and um, you can download the data from the website. Yeah, you can do it yourself in MATLAB. We have a price vector, as you can see, 103, 82, 106. Uh, I, think, I think these are two prices, and this should be a point, but you can check that in the Excel file. We have the time points of all bond payments and all those cash flows. What is the cash flow of a bond? Now, these are the nine bonds we're using. Look at this one. It is a bond that was issued with a 10% coupon. So the UK government was willing to pay 10% on a bond. This one was probably issued in the 70s, maybe even 60s, with a 30-year maturity. Might be that they paid out that much. These are the different prices. And you have different coupons. And what does, for ex let's assume this bond one matures in 2020. How would the cash flow look like for this bond? It will look like 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 100. 10. So, because these are coupon bonds, it's very simple to come up with the cash flows. Now, these are the dirty prices. What is the dirty price? What is the clean price? Now, let's take the first coupon. The next coupon is paid on the 15th of November. We are on the 4th of September, meaning that in two months' time, you will get 10 pounds coupon. But the seller of the bond has, hold, has held on to the bond for 10 months and he will not see anything from this uh, coupon, from this coupon payment of 10 pounds. So he needs to be reimbursed. He needs to get a payment for holding on to the bond for 10 out of 12 months without getting his share of the next coupon payment. And depending on whether this is incorporated in the price, you have the dirty price or the clean price. In German, we call this Stückzinsen. Sie müssen mit Stückzinsen arbeiten, weil wenn Sie jetzt ähm, den Bond, die Anleihe, nicht genau an dem Tag verkaufen, an dem Sie auch die, gerade die äh, letzte Couponzahlung bekommen haben, dann halten Sie ja einen Bond, sagen wir mal elf Monate, und Sie bekommen die nächste Couponzahlung nicht, weil die bekommt ja dann der Käufer. Deswegen müssen Sie für diese elf von zwölf Monaten müssen Sie entschädigt werden, anteilig äh, an der nächsten Couponzahlung. Und der, das ist der Unterschied zwischen dem Dirty Price und dem Clean Price. Das heißt, der Dirty Price, der Clean Price, ist diese Art oder war auf jeden Fall der Clean Price? Der Dirty Price, äh, gucken Sie nach. <lacht> Ich meine, ähm, ich meine, der Dirty Price, da sind die Stück Zinsen noch drin. Hm? Und wir müssten sie dann rausrechnen. Now, because we have so many different uh, points in time, where uh, the coupons of each of these different bonds are being paid out, we have a, actually we have a very large matrix. We only have nine lines, we only have nine rows, but a huge number of columns because all those different coupon payments take place at different points in time. 
So you can see this is the first, the second, the third, the fourth one, and so on and so on. And let's see, when I'm in five, do we have this here? No. Okay. And this is the matrix C. And now we'll use a cubic spline um, to estimate the price function. So we'll use a cubic spline with Q plus one nodes, psi zero up to psi Q. Uh, the cubic spline looks like this. The spline has Q plus three parameters. And what we'll do next? We'll introduce another six nodes, three on the left and three on the right. Uh, we'll then obtain a basis of the cubic splines on the interval we are looking at. Um, and we'll have what is called B splines. I said basis splines, die wiederum, das hatte ich vergessen zu sagen, splines, genauso wie Polynome, bilden wieder einen Vektor. Und dann wissen Sie, ein Vektor hat eine Basis, hat unendlich viele Basen. Und eine Basis ist gegeben durch die B-Splines, die natürlich diesen Namen schon bekommen haben, weil sie die Basis-Splines sind. Das Bild mit Basis. And these B-Splines, they look like this. And we now use the B-Splines and determine the discount curve. Um, it's very simple. We use B-Splines. They form a basis of the linear space of splines. So any spline can be represented as a linear combination of the basis splines with m parameters. Ja? Wenn Spline aber doch ein Vektor ist und wir eine Basis des Vektorraums kennen durch die B-Splines, können Sie ja jeden Vektor darstellen als Linearkombination der Vektoren, der Basisvektoren. Und das machen wir hier. Wir suchen ja die Funktion d, die Discount Curve. Die Discount Curve wird jetzt einfach dargestellt als Linearkombination mit m Koeffizienten und phi 1 bis phi m den basis splines den b splines so we have what the discount curve the discount factors are given by this matrix of the b splines times the vector of the coefficients and we need to optimize the following problem We need to take the price vector minus, now the theoretical price should be C times D, cash flows times discount curve. Instead of discount curve, the discount function, the discount factors, we want those, we substitute D with phi times Z. And then we take the difference between P, the actual price vector, and C, phi, Z, the theoretical prices, we'll take the norm, we'll square it, and then we'll minimize them over Z. Also, was machen Sie hier? Sie minimieren den quadratischen absoluten pricing error, den Preisbewertungsfehler. P sind Ihre tatsächlichen Preise, C mal D wären ja die theoretischen Preise, wären aber die Barwerte der Cashflows. Anstatt der Diskontierungsfaktoren, die kennen wir ja gerade nicht, setzen wir jetzt hier Linearkombinationen aus den B-Splines und den Koeffizienten Z ein. Und dann nehmen wir die Differenz P minus theoretischer Preis, Absolutbetrag, brauchen wir jetzt auch, also können wir auch einen Norm oder einen Absolutbetrag nehmen und quadrieren das Ganze. Ergebnis ist ein Vektor Z an Koeffizienten, sodass wir eine in sich stimmige Bewertung der Bonds bekommen und der Bepreisungsfehler, der Pricing Error, minimal ist. So, if we have an N times M matrix A with C5, and if it has full rank, then unique solutions without any further constraints is, well, it's the usual OLS regression analysis result, A transpose times A inverted times A transpose times P. Hmm? x strich x zu minus 1 x strich y. Einfach nur eine Regressionsanalyse. We can, however, also require that at this starting point, 0, um, the discount factor is 1. Very simple. Today, if we start, well, the discount factor should be 1. Okay.
And as a result, we will now use eight B splines with 12 notes. Again, remember that we'll start at zero, but we'll take three additional points left of zero, even if there is no such thing as a negative maturity, but it helps us um, to um, approximate the function. And then we'll use one, six, eight, 11, five, 20, 25, and 30. And these will be the notes. Um, and you can find all these, because you can imagine this, it takes a lot of time to write this down in a text file. And I did it. It's not a very challenging task, so just download the files and you can uh, use them in MATLAB. Um, and let's do this in MATLAB. Well, first define the B-spline. B-spline.m is the function. It gives you a function value if you call B-spline with x, k, and xi. This is not too interesting. It simply is a B-spline. It's the k B-spline given by this function here, based on these nodes. Yeah? So you will need a vector xi. You will need an information. Is this the first? Is this the second? Is this the third? And so on, B-spline. And then bspline.m, this function gives you the B-splines. Then we'll take this vector of nodes, minus 20, minus 5, 2, and so on. Then let's calculate the matrix psi of the B-spline values. Um, it's a huge matrix with 104 uh, columns. Then we'll calculate psi with the B-splines. And the target function, the objective function, is P transposed minus C times psi times Z transposed squared. And then we'll just sum it up. Yeah, you can also take the uh, norm, but in this case, we'll do ordinary least squares. And then we already know how to do optimization in MATLAB. Use fmin unc. We have no constraints, so we can use unconstrained function maximization. We'll start at 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and the result is 17.95, 11.35, and so on. And what are these? These are the coefficients z with which we can calculate the discount factors using the bleed splines. And this value is what? This is the sum of the square pricing errors. So in total, we have a sum of the square pricing errors of 10 pence. Now we have the coefficients. Let's calculate the swap rates. Very simple. For all maturities, we have 104 maturities. Some of them are only a few days apart. But nevertheless, we have 104 maturities. The spot rate, T, is simply given by minus log phi times the optimal Z star, Z stern, uh, divided by T. We can do the same for the forward rates and the discount rates. Uh, and if you take simply phi times Z, you get the discount curve. So we'll have the discount curve, the spot rate curve, the spot curve, the yield curve, and the forward curve. And this is what it looks like. These are the prices of the zero bonds with increasing maturity. Very simple to see that it should start at one. What is the price for one euro if I give it to you in five seconds? Well, obviously, one euro. What is the price for one euro next year? Well, it could probably be 80 cents, 70 cents, somewhere below. So this is the discount curve. These are the discount factors. This is the yield curve. And as you can see, very common with these models, uh, you have some type of oscillation in the very short uh, term um, part of the function and a normal yield curve after that. These are one, I think these are months. So we'll have 
uh, almost 10 years. And as you can see, even in the short term, the short term interest rates back then were at at least 5%. And with increasing maturity, they increased to almost 8%. And if you remember those models uh, and those theoretical models from your finance introduction, this is what you call a flat interest rate, this is what you call a normal interest rate, and this would be an inverse um, yield curve. But this time you were able to estimate it, not just assume it. And this is um, the... I think this should also be, um, I think this is not correct, this should be the forward rate. These are the forward rates. Yeah? Okay. Now let's extend this model. Um, we'll introduce the family of so-called exponential polynomial curves. This family includes two very famous models. One is by Nelson and Siegel. The other one is by Svensson. I would advise you to take the current interest rate statistics of Deutsche Bundesbank um, and they publish their estimates of the yield curve, uh, at least they used to, uh, and they would tell you that they are using the model of Svensson to estimate the yield curve. So this is actually the very same model Deutsche Bundesbank used. Um, what do we do? As before, let x, now we are now modeling the forward curve, x mapping is mapped to f, be the forward curve, and we'll write it as a function phi of x and z. So um, implicitly we have the discount curve, again here, transform it, uh, and we have a parameter space z. Now as before, we are estimating the yield curve by adjusting the theoretical prices by marking them to the market, by minimizing the pricing error. Um, and we are now writing D, the discount factors, with the exponential function and minus integral from zero to x1 over this function phi with different payment dates. Now, a first example for such an exponential polynomial curve family is the nelson siegel model. The yield curves in the Nelson Siegel model are given by phi is given by z1 plus z2 plus z3 z3 times x times the exponential function of minus z4 times x. We have four parameters and it is, well, not technically not a polynomial, but exponentially polynomial. And the result is that it looks like a polynomial and it can model one half. Because if we know, for example, that the, the yield curve will look like this, well, we don't need a very complicated spline for that. Might be too smooth. You know? Actually, not too smooth, but it might be too flexible. And sometimes you will see something like this. So a function that is simpler will suffice in contrast to the very flexible spline model. So we'll use Nelson Siegel. Nelson Siegel can model one hump, ein Huckel, uh, and it only has four parameters. Very simple. Nelson Siegel is not too flexible, and this is an advantage, but it can also be a disadvantage if you think that it is just one parameter short of what actual yield curves will look like. So Svensson introduced an additional parameter, actually two, uh, Z5 and Z6, and we can now model two humps, like something like this. And that's it. That's the only difference to Nelson Siegel, um, and we'll now use this. As you can see, uh, it's uh, an exponential polynomial, uh, and we're using the same bond data and now applying the Nelson, Siegel, and Swenson models. So first of all, let's do the theoretical price uh, with Nelson, Siegel. We're given Z, T, 
binar, which is simply a dummy variable, if it's one, we're using Nelson Siegel. If we're if it's set to zero, we're using the Swenson model. You can see that here we have two uh, if clauses. If binar is equal to one, we'll have Nelson Siegel, else we'll use Swenson. What we are doing is we'll first define the function phi. We are given these parameters z, and then phi of x is z1 plus z2 plus z3 times x times the exponential function. With Swenson, it's a little bit more complicated, and we need six parameters. Then the discount factors are given how? The discount factors, remember this. This is. These are the discount factors. So exponential function minus the integral from 0 to x1 of phi. Phi is given by this or this. If we maximize this later on, we are looking for the parameter z. And then, obviously, in the MATLAB code, we'll have to write this, the discount factor i, is the exponential function of an integral, inter, and the integral is given by minus traps. What is trap z? Traps. What could this be in MATLAB? It's an approximation to the integral using the trapezoid rule. Sie nehmen die Trapezregel und Trapz, diese Standardfunktion Trapz in MATLAB, berechnet, nähert ein Integral an mit Hilfe der Trapezregel. Und Sie brauchen da natürlich Schnittstellen für. Und sehen Sie mal hier, x und y, da berechnen wir gerade die Stützstellen, um das Integral bestimmen zu können. Also einfach, ja, das, also nehmen wir mal davon an, phi wäre jetzt so eine Funktion, da haben wir den Punkt, den Punkt, den Punkt, den Punkt und den Punkt. Und Sie bestimmen das Integral unter der Fläche, einfach indem Sie jetzt hier sagen, nimm x, ne, x, 0, an der Stelle, der Stelle, der Stelle, der Stelle, y bestimmen die Funktionswerte und dann minus das Integral xy und dann Exponentialfunktion dieses Integrals, fertig ist das Ganze. Und dann ist das Ergebnis hier natürlich c, die Cashflows, mal die Diskontierungsfraktion, also c mal dies. Und dann machen wir das, was wir vorher auch gemacht haben, we'll do the same as before, we'll minimize over the coefficient vector z, we'll have to decide whether we want to use Nelson Siegel or Swenson, and we'll minimize the sum of the square pricing errors p minus the theoretical price. And again, you can see the squares, uh, the sum of the square pricing errors is now 18 pennies, 18 pence. And this is Z star. Those are the four parameters in the Nelson Siegel model. And it looks like this. This is the yield curve with one half. As you can see, it doesn't oscillate too much in the very short term maturity range. Um, with Swenson, it gets a little bit more flexible. You'll have a second half. But this is the best trade off between a polynomial interpolation, which is way off because of oscillation and a spline model that is could be regarded as too flexible as you can see that you have very small increases some in somewhere in between so this is the nelson siegel model and this is used by deutsche bundesbank do you have any questions? Actually, this is almost the pinnacle of this lecture. You will use optimization. You will need to approximate an integral. We haven't spoken about this. I did this in the previous years, but I think it is not too interesting because it's, it's just an auxiliary function here. You, if you were ever thinking of 
estimating of approximating an integral, just look up the standard functions implemented in MATLAB. And they, even the very simple ones, like the trapezoid rule, will work quite nicely. Um, and then you need a system of linear equations for the spline interpolation, and you're using the whole arsenal uh, of weapons here at your disposal uh, to come up with this estimation of the yield curve. And then this, these are your risk-free interest rates you're using in every model, in every pricing model. If it's asset pricing with bonds, with stocks, with credit default swaps, everywhere you need a risk-free rate. And if you don't have... Um, the data. And if you don't want to assume R is 5%, you need to estimate this, or you need to rely on estimates, for example, by Deutsche Bundesbank or the Federal Reserve. And these central banks are using these models to estimate the yield curve. Okay. I now need to make some final preparations for the inaugural lecture by Professor Shia. If you don't have any questions, we have 20 slides left. I would say that uh, we can talk about these uh, final slides next week. And if you have any questions, we can deal with those questions next week. And if you don't have any questions today, thank you for your attention and see you next week. Thank you.